Hello, everyone. My name's Ken Blackburn. I'm the program manager for the museum at Campbell River. And I'm uh, really happy to have a guest author with us today, uh, John McFarlane, whose uh, book Around the World in a Dugout Canoe has come out. And we're going, we're going to have a chat with uh, John today and uh, learn more about himself and about the book. So welcome, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm just delighted to be here. Yeah, well, we're very happy to have you. Um, normally, we would be trying to host you at the museum uh, as a live talk and a book signing and meet people. But of course, we are uh, into different days. So we're, we're all ad adjusting to this new kind of digital um, digital workshops or, or digital presentations, I guess. So uh, anyways, John, well, let's just start with a, a kind of background about yourself and um, and lead into how you got interested in uh, in the story. Thanks, Ken. I, I currently I'm retired and uh, living in on the east coast of Vancouver Island. I uh, I've done a number of things over my life. I started out uh, as a young teenager in the Navy. Uh, I spent uh, 20 years working with Parks Canada in various locations across Canada. Uh, and after that, uh, I pursued a career in museums. I was the director of the Maritime Museum of British Columbia in Victoria for uh, five or six years. And uh, uh, subsequently have carried on my, my interest in uh, nautical heritage. Uh, more as a hobby uh, while I pursued other career options. I'm the author of 14 books, uh, lots and lots of articles, and I uh, conduct the Nauticopedia project on the internet. This is a, an online uh, searchable database of uh, vessel histories and biographies of mariners, all related to the uh, nautical history of British Columbia. Wow. Okay. And what, where did you kind of first encounter the story that we will talk about in a second, but especially around the, the particular boat that's featured in, in, the, in your book? Well, the Tilikum, which is a dugout canoe, is part of the collection of the Maritime Museum of British Columbia in Victoria. And so it was one of the artifacts that I inherited when I took over the operation of the museum back in 1989. Now I had known about the telecom since I was a kid. It used to sit in the old Thunderbird Park across from the uh, Parliament buildings in Victoria. When I was a young kid, I used to go to the old Crystal Gardens pool to learn how to swim. And afterward, I would cross the street and peer at the telecom. I didn't really know much about it at that time. I just knew that it had done something significant and I was a bit surprised years later to encounter it in the collection. I read Captain Voss's book and the book of his first mate, Norman Luxton, to try and understand the story. And as you can imagine, I took for granted that the stories that they told in their books were the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And so this was the story that I repeated for years without really thinking much about it. It was just one of the many artifacts that I had to interpret at the museum. And uh, it wasn't until I decided that there was probably uh, a need for a more contemporary book on the subject that I started to do research and discovered that there were all sorts of difficulties with the stories that were being told by Voss and Luxton, that there were uh, bits of, of the story that seemed to have been left out, lots of mistakes in the stories. And gee, when I compared them, the two stories didn't really match up. It was almost as if there were two separate voyages. And so I started to research this. And that was 30 years ago. And then uh, I worked on it for a couple of years. Uh, life seemed to intervene there and I uh, really didn't get the book finished. It was a pretty daunting task, you know, because uh, it's an international story. A lot of the story is far away from Victoria. And quite frankly, I didn't have the resources to travel to Australia or New Zealand or South Africa or England to research this. And uh, it just seemed a little 
uh, too difficult to do a proper job. So it sat on the shelf for many years. And it wasn't until uh, five or six years ago that I renewed a bit of interest in this. And I started to pursue the uh, research again. But now, with uh, all of the resources that are available on the World Wide Web, it's really possible to look at first-hand information uh, from a distance. And that has made all the difference. I was able to review thousands and thousands of newspaper articles, for example. And I discovered that uh, there were lots of uh, small collections of memorabilia related to the voyage. There were people who had letters and clippings and brochures. And uh, over time, I was able to start to really piece this together. Yeah, what a, what a trajectory and, and probably something that all researchers can certainly relate to, uh, especially in the museum field with A, the what you have recorded doesn't seem to add up to what you discover. B, life gets in the way and projects take a lot longer. And C, with the, you know, with advances in technology, yeah, the access to documents is just yeah, absolutely a, a savior for you know the expenses of travel and having to visit archives. So yeah, what a, what a story. Um, okay, let, let's talk a little bit specifically about the parts of the story to lead into it. And um, we'll start with the boat, the telecom, because it, it has a, itself a very interesting uh, history. Yes, it's a First Nations dugout canoe. Uh, that's the only thing we positively uh, uh, know for sure. But we've done a lot of cross-checking on its origins and we've discovered that there are six different stories about where it comes from. They're all similar, and they all may, uh, some of them, be parts of the same story, but we can't really quite tell. But we think that the vessel comes from uh, somewhere in uh, Clairquet Sound, given the size of the tree that must have been used by the builders of the canoe. We believe that the canoe was built about 18... 50 or in the 1850s, and that it was a whaling canoe. By the time uh, the canoe was of interest to uh, Voss and Luxton, it had made its way around to Cowichan Bay and was sitting on a beach there. So one of the stories was that it had been paddled down from the west coast of Vancouver Island and that the owners had died of a disease, possibly smallpox, uh, and that it was then currently owned by a family of First Nations people who were living in Cowichan Bay. So Voss, who was looking for a suitable dugout canoe to convert into a sailing vessel, found this one on the beach, and he uh, uh, negotiated with the, the owner. Uh, he paid in uh, gold coins, and uh, apparently... After that, the deal was sealed with some, uh, some rum, and uh, then the vessel was taken away to Galliano Island for a conversion to a, uh, to a, a, a sailing vessel. Okay. And, and this, the interest is coming from you know, an individual named Captain John Voss. He's, he's obviously the main uh, sailor of this boat and uh, the main character of the story. What, what did you discover about who John Voss was and, and his background that would lead him to this, this kind of interest in, in converting a dugout canoe to be something very seaworthy and, and take it around the world? Wow. Well, John Voss was a complex character he was born uh, a Danish citizen in a place which is now part of Germany. The borders of these countries uh, changed quite a lot over that time period. So he was a, an ethnic German, but considered himself to be a Dane. Uh, no one else in his family appears to have been a mariner, but he went to sea as a very young man and apprenticed and worked his way up to becoming a master 
after full rig sailing ships and sailed worldwide. So he was quite well traveled. He knew a lot about uh, what was going on. Uh, at, for some reason, he came ashore. And over uh, the years, I've discovered that he seems to have come ashore in San Francisco. And be, he bought a butcher shop and was a meat cutter in Oakland, California. And at this stage, he appears to have gotten involved with some shady characters, some corrupt U.S. Customs officials, and became involved in the smuggling of uh, people from Asia and uh, opium into the United States. Uh, managed to carry on this activity uh, without being arrested, although all of his confederates were arrested and went to jail, he fled to Canada and settled on Vancouver Island. Uh, he made quite a bit of money from this activity, and he appears to have bought a hotel, a butcher shop, and a bar in in uh, Crofton on the southern southeast coast of Vancouver Island. Even there, he was involved in some shady activities. Apparently, he would drug sailors and sell them to the masters of sailing ships who were short of crew members. This is known as Shanghaiing. And uh, the sailors would wake up on their way to the Orient and m maybe years before they uh, managed to get home again. This, the waterfront on Vancouver Island in those days, and this would be in the late 1890s was a pretty rough place. Uh, it's not uh, the sweet and, uh, and, and simple place that we have in our imagination. Anyway, he made quite a lot of money from this and he was able to buy a hotel and a restaurant in Victoria. So he was uh, be really improving himself. Uh, we have to remember at this time it was not illegal uh, to buy or to manufacture uh, opium in Canada. Uh, and very similar to the period later with alcohol being exported into the United States, uh, it was quite legal to uh, own this material, but it was illegal to take it into the United States. So what he was doing was well known to the people of Victoria and was even discussed in the paper pages of the Victoria uh, colonist, and in fact, he was offered congratulations on some of the big drug deals that he did. And there was uh, open speculation about what he would do to invest the money that he was making. This was a bit of an eye opener for me. And anyway, he uh, got into the hotel business, but this does not seem to have fit uh, his personality. He grew bored with this, as you can imagine, with kind of a swashbuckling character like this. And sitting in the lobby of the hotel telling sea stories to uh, visitors to the hotel just didn't seem to be exactly what he was most interested in. So he was looking for something to do. And this is the time when he met a young journalist from uh, Manitoba named Norman Luxton who Norman Luxton was running a, a little uh, scandal sheet newspaper uh, from a second floor office over on Johnson Street in Victoria. And this was not, uh, it, this was not uh, turning out financially uh, viable for Luxton. Luxton too was interested in switching careers. And it was in November of the year. And of course, we all know what the weather's like on Vancouver Island then. It was raining and cold. The two of them were getting independently depressed, and Luxton was dreaming about white sand beaches in the South Pacific, and I guess uh, good-looking ladies who might be seen on the beach there, and he got it, it into his head that he should sail there somehow, but not being a sailor, he needed help. So he went to uh, Voss, and they had a little get-together, and Luxton said, you know, uh, we've both uh, recently read the book uh, Sailing Alone uh, Around the World. Yep. Another uh, a Canadian, Joshua Slocum, had recently become rich and famous by writing about his uh, adventures sailing alone on a, a wooden 
uh, sailing yacht, uh, the Spray. And he had become a world uh, media figure. And so Luxton proposed to Voss that they should do something similar. And that being a journalist, that he, Luxton, would write about it and Voss would get them around safely. And he suggested that they buy a sealing schooner. So immediately Voss was captivated by this idea and said, well, it's a great idea, but look, anybody can sail a sealing schooner around the world. There's nothing special about that. He said, let's out slocum slocum. Let's do it in a smaller, more peculiar vessel. He said, I know just the thing. Let's convert a dugout canoe, a whaling canoe, Let's convert it to a sailing vessel and sail that around the world. He said, we'll get lots of attention. People will really uh, think this is intriguing. And he said, we'll become rich and famous. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the deal was made very quickly. And that's why they were out looking to buy a canoe. And uh, they converted the canoe to a three-masted uh, schooner which was a very unusual rig in those days. And even now it's quite unusual. You don't really see a small vessel rigged like this, but uh, naval architects have told me that there was quite a lot of genius in the, this choice in that the rig was very adaptable and that it could be uh, used with any combination of sail set in order to match the sea conditions. And uh, the, uh, the vessel itself, although was not really well suited for this kind of a voyage. It was really cramped. The little cabin that they built on the vessel could only hold one person at a time. Uh, so one person was on deck steering and working the sails while the other person was inside either sleeping or washing or preparing food or uh, just waiting to come on watch. So for 12 hours a day, each of them was exposed outside. So the conditions must have been just awful. They, there was really nowhere to go on the boat, and except when they were asleep, there was no privacy. Uh, they only carried enough water uh, so that they could drink about a pint of water a day, and that was for everything that they consumed. So that was for their, their cooking, uh, for brushing their teeth, and for just drinking to keep hydrated. So... That water, after many weeks, would have become quite stale and rancid. Uh, the food that they ate, uh, the fresh food, would have disappeared very quickly after the first couple of weeks. And after that, it would have been just canned food. So when you add that all up, uh, the, the living conditions on board the vessel must have been very, very unpleasant. And for any of us who have uh, been in close proximity with others for a long period of time with no break, you get a kind of cabin fever. And although they didn't recognize this, what was happening, it came clear to me by reading their accounts that the two of them, by the end of the first long leg of the voyage, which was about 60 days, grew to hate each other intensely. And poor old uh, uh, Luxton, who had never been to sea, was really not sure, I don't think in his own mind, what to expect. So this was not the luxurious voyage to the South Seas that he had imagined. Yeah. And For, what, go ahead. What, what, as their original intention, was it to take it around the world or was it to yes. simply get, oh, so it was going to be a, a around the world voyage? Yes, it was a stunt. It was a stunt uh, designed uh, to duplicate what uh, Slocum had done, which was to go around the world. And at that time, in, in around 1901, this was a time when people were doing uh, amazing things. They were exploring Africa and looking for the source of the Nile. They were climbing mountains, uh, doing archaeology, uh, visiting strange places. Uh, and as somebody summed it up, this was a period where men with huge uh, mustaches did incredibly brave but stupid things <laughs> uh, and then wrote about them afterward. And so the, 
Luxton and Voss were simply replicating what they had seen other people doing. And this was something that the public had grown to expect. They loved to read about this in magazines and newspapers. Okay. Yeah. So they set out, as you say, the, the first uh, leg, they left from where yeah. and headed for where? Well, they left from Victoria and headed across the Pacific. So they really didn't, they had intended to go to Tahiti. That was a name that they knew that they had, uh, they had read uh, Mutiny on the Bounty and, or, or uh, read about Mutiny, Mutiny on the Bounty and they had read other uh, accounts of uh, people living the idyllic life in Tahiti. So that was one of their goals. Uh, Lexton thought that they were going to visit Hawaii, but it was clear that Voss, who felt that he was on the most wanted list in the United States from his uh, smuggling activities, had no intention of visiting any port that was controlled by the United States, and that would have included Hawaii. So he set a course that gave them a wide berth. Other than that, they simply decided to visit any island that came in their path, and they had a one sheet chart of the Pacific Ocean, uh, which showed everything between North America and Australia. So they left Victoria and headed uh, west, and it was whatever islands that the currents and winds caused them to bump into are the ones that they visited. So they really did not know in advance where they were going. They did not know anything about the islands that they were visiting. It was a very big mystery to them. And they were actually in the beginning quite fearful because they had heard many stories about cannibals and the, the likelihood of their uh, running into uh, violence from the local inhabitants. Uh, I think that of the two of them, Lexton was the braver. He was always looking for uh, adventure and Voss uh, was much more fearful. In fact, uh, they carried weapons on board and the, the number of times they were on the verge of using them on defenseless people simply because they were so frightened. But as time went on, they became braver and braver. And they... Uh, uh, develop the kind of social skills that you need to get along with with uh, other people whose cultures are quite different from your own. Mm -hmm. And over over the the ensuing months, they grew to quite enjoy these contacts with strange people. Mm -hmm. And the strange people, of course, were just as intrigued by them. They they had never seen a an odd little uh, vessel like this visit, and they were even more intrigued when they discovered that the vessel had been originally built by people just like them, and that this little vessel was making big oceanic uh, voyages. And it made them uh, uh, proud of their own accomplishments as navigators, because of course, the Polynesian uh, people are uh, great, uh, had great abilities to travel long distances without any kind of navigational instruments in small canoes. And so I think Voss was also picking up some uh, stories that gave him confidence as he was co traveling along. Yeah, yeah, remarkable. And, but there, as you alluded to, they um, didn't really become warm and fuzzy with each other over time. So there, that relationship broke down. So what, what kind of happened there and happened next? Well, uh, uh, Luxton suffering from cabin fever. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Voss, being an old sea captain, uh, was uh, pretty rough on his, uh, on his mate because he would have been used to barking orders. He would have probably done so on a sailing ship with a lot of threats involved about the violence that he would do on the crew members who did not move swiftly enough or who made a mistake. And so I'm sure he used a lot of this kind of language on Luxton who grew to actually believe that he was in danger. He believed that Voss was going to kill him. And uh, when you add that on to the terrible living conditions and the, the cabin fever, I think he probably suffered a bit of a breakdown. And he resolved, as soon as they got to some reasonably sized port, to leave the voyage. He wanted to go home. He had had enough. This was not 
the the wonderful adventure that he had envisioned. And so when they got to Fiji, he announced that they were done, that they were, that he was going to uh, travel on a steamer to Australia, and that he would meet Voss there. But he did recruit a replacement for himself. He found a young fellow, uh, just a, a young teenager really, who was a mate on a ship uh, to take his place. And so he got his replacement, saw Voss and the replacement off on the next leg towards Australia. And then he himself got on the freighter and worked his way to Sydney. So uh, for Lexton, this was uh, uh, a much more comfortable voyage. But for Voss, uh, it was simply a continuation of what had gone on before. But he was getting along much better with this young fellow, apparently, by his own account than he had with Luxton. They were uh, sharing stories and discovering that they actually had some friends in common. And two or three days out of Fiji, they uh, encountered a huge storm. Uh, and in the middle of the night, when this young fellow who was on watch, uh, Lux, uh, Voss was coming up into the cockpit to relieve him. And the young fellow stood up for some reason, carrying the compass uh, in, his, uh, in his hands. The compass was not a fixed thing on the vessel. It was something that could have been moved around. And at that moment, a huge wave broke over the boat and washed him overboard, carrying the compass. So here they were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, in a little vessel that had no uh, engine was very, very difficult to turn the thing around. But the worst thing was neither Voss nor his mate could swim. Neither of them was wearing a life preserver. Neither of them was tied to the vessel. And there was no light, of course, uh, something that they could have shone. And with the howling wind and the crashing seas, Voss's shouts, uh, to, where are you, you know, w w uh, shout to me, to, indicate where you are he couldn't hear a thing and it took him 20 minutes to get the boat turned around uh, to come back to approximately the spot where he thought that the young fellow had gone in the water so modern yachtsmen who have done transoceanic voyages tell me that in their uh, uh, opinion that the young fellow was as good as dead the moment that he hit the water that there was no chance of rescue uh, and that it was a disaster really waiting to happen. Voss was devastated. He sailed around for two weeks looking for any sign of the young fellow, and he appears to have had a nervous breakdown, blaming himself for the, for the death of this young fellow. And uh, eventually he snapped out of it. He was, he was quite concerned because without a compass, uh, he thought navigation would have been impossible. But as modern uh, navigators have told me, really, all he had to do was head west and sooner or later he was going to bump into Australia. Uh, but it took him quite a long time to, to think this one out. Uh, so he actually was able to uh, uh, travel for the rest of the distance alone. It's the only part of the whole voyage he did alone. And he made it all the way to uh, Sydney. And I don't know whether it's by luck or by skill, he made his first landfall right off of the entrance to Sydney Harbour, which was where he had originally been intending to travel. And on arrival, he uh, told his story about what had happened to the young uh, mate. And he linked up with Luxton. And together, he and Luxton uh, displayed the vessel. This is the first time that they actually displayed it publicly and they uh, did it as a kind of uh, sideshow attraction, uh, erecting a tent and inviting people to come pay admission to tour the vessel and to listen to a lecture from Voss. And at that point, uh, Luxton decided that he'd had enough really that, and with the death of the mate, that that was it, he was going to return to Canada. And so from then on, Voss had a whole series of mates. We think that there were about a dozen of them. 
none of them lasted more than one leg of the voyage because the conditions were so terrible that they couldn't stand it. And so each one would quit at the end, at the next port of call, and he would recruit a new mate. And uh, uh, Luxton does not appear after that point to have ever met up with Voss again. But he uh, uh, moved to Banff, Alberta, where he established uh, the Crag and Canyon newspaper there, which is still running. And he started to buy up property in downtown Banff and became quite a wealthy businessman and local entrepreneur. And he established a trading post uh, where he uh, bought and sold First Nations uh, curios and artifacts to the public. That operation is still uh, in business today. And the name of Luxton in Banff is uh, very famous. He wrote his own account of the story after he discovered that, Luck, uh, that Voss had written his own, which he published in 1913 uh, in Japan. Uh, that was 10 years after the voyage. Voss had been waiting for Luxton to write the book, but it never appeared. And so he wrote his own and published it privately. Luxton was enraged by this. Voss stole my book. But of course, when you think about it, he was the owner of a newspaper. He could have written a book. He could have published it anytime he wanted. He wasn't dependent on finding a publisher, but he did not do that. He uh, uh, wrote the book and then he put it away with instructions that it, this was for his daughter and that it was never to be published. Uh, so curiously, uh, Voss's book has been in print continuously for 110 years. Uh, Luxton's book was not published until 1970 after he and of course Voss were dead. He put a carelessly worded footnote in his book which said, Voss murdered the mate. The mate did not fall overboard accidentally, that he murdered the mate. And his daughter, who disregarded his, her father's instructions not to publish the book, published it and included that statement. So it was like a literary time bomb to which none of the characters who were involved could actually comment on and that the story started to circulate that Voss was a drunkard, that he was a womanizer and a murderer. <clears throat> it was a really a kind of defamation of character, which I personally, after all my research, feel that Voss uh, does not deserves. He may not have been a very nice person, but he was certainly none of the things that he was accused of by Luxton. And these stories have been uh, circulated widely on the internet. And as we know about internet stories, then people have been expanding on that and uh, magnifying it and uh, making this out to be much, much, much uh, more terrible than was actually the truth. So yeah, after the falling out uh, with Luxton, you were saying that there was many other mates, uh, Voss kept on going how eventually did the did the voyage sort of come to its either conclusion or did it just stop at some point? What kind of what happened there? Well, Voss carried on. He started to really enjoy the voyage. He enjoyed the hardship of living on the vessel. He the the, the mates may have been miserable, but Voss seems to have been right in his element and enjoyed it thoroughly. And most of all, he enjoyed the notoriety and attention that he received in each of the por ports. He became a really uh, media rock star of his age. He was kind of the, uh, the combination of the Kardashians and the cast of the Game of Thrones all rolled up into one. Uh, the wire services carried every report from every place that he touched in great detail. There were tens of thousands of reports in many languages around the world. People were following this uh, avidly. And uh, newspapers all over the world, even in the Central Africa and in, uh, 
in Russia and in South America were carrying these stories. So when the boat arrived, people already knew who he was. Three years after the voyage started, he made it to England. And this is at this stage, he seems to have grown tired of the voyage. He had it in his mind that he had sailed around the world because he had touched Brazil. But if you look at a map, you can see very easily that he missed quite a bit of the uh, circumnavigation of the globe. And it wasn't until the vessel was put on the deck of a freighter many years later and shipped to Victoria from England that the vessel actually completed the circumnavigation. Uh, he himself uh, sold the vessel in England to, to some yachtsmen and started to pursue other interests of his own, uh, eventually moving to Japan, where he was in the fur sealing trade. And then uh, uh, he had a couple of other small boat voyages that he wrote about uh, and uh, near the end of his life, uh, he seems to have ended up as a penniless person. He moved to Tracy, California, where he had some cousins, uh, operated a uh, taxi service there, and died penniless of pneumonia, and he's buried in Tracy, California. Wow, wow. And, and then what of the boat uh, that... Uh so it, it was shipped back to Canada and what was its kind of fate? Well, it was abandoned in England and for some reason, people there uh, knowing its origin sent reports back to Victoria. and The people of Victoria were still very much uh, uh, in love with the vessel. They were enamored of it. And there was a great public outcry about this. And, the, and it was arranged that the vessel would be brought back to Victoria on the deck of a freighter in the 1930s and to be put on display. And so at first it was put on display in front of the Crystal Gardens across from the Empress Hotel. And then uh, later it was moved about a block away to a place next to the parliament buildings, which used to be known as Thunderbird Park, where there were uh, totem poles and a carving house. And the telecom was put on display there in a shed. When the uh, then Provincial Museum uh, declared their intention to build the new building, which now is their, their home as the Royal BC Museum, uh, they needed the site, and so the telecom had to be moved. Uh, this was in 1960, and the Maritime Museum of British Columbia, which was formerly in Bastion Square, stepped forward and said, gosh, you know, we would like to have that. And the vessel was uh, brought up to Bastion Square, and they knocked a hole in the side of the building and rolled the vessel up sideways and slid it inside. And that's where it was when I encountered it. And it was on display there for uh, nearly 40 years. Uh, and in fact, it was one of the big draws. People from all over the world used to come to visit it. It was like a, a, a pilgrimage that some of them were making. And we even had yachtsmen sail from the old Soviet Union in Siberia to Victoria specifically to see the telecom. They came uh, up and uh, they all stood silently with their hands on the vessel. It was as if uh, they were having a spiritual connection with the thing. Uh, and I was quite impressed by this, quite moved by this. And this, it was events like this that piqued my interest in getting behind the story. The Captain Voss's book, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned, still in print, was translated into 12 languages. And there is a Russian version of the book. It was widely read in Russia, and it had influenced a large numbers of people around the world to do ocean voyaging. So when you think about it, before 1900, yachtsmen did not do these kinds of trans-Pacific voyages. They only did coastal cruising, whether it was in Australia or New Zealand or in North America. And it was Voss who demonstrated to them that these voyages were possible, that the blue water cruising craze, which we see so much of now, started. And people noticed that Voss was becoming famous. He didn't become rich, but he become, became famous. 
And they began to think, well, we can become famous too. We'll do it in an even smaller vessel. We'll do it faster. We'll do it alone. We'll do it with the oldest person or the youngest person, or we'll, I'll go around six times. And these are the kind of stunts that we see today and that are reported in the press. Wow. What a great story, John. Well done. And uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, John McFarland's book, uh, Around the World in a Dugout Canoe, is available through the uh, museum at Campbell River. Um, so uh, basically, we can leave the story there, John. I know from looking at the book and, and reading through it, there's a lot more to the story than very much more, yes. Yeah, that we've been able to, you know, encapsulate here. So a fascinating read. Well done. And, and just to kind of close up, what, what are you working on now or what's next for you? Well, I'm working on a book on shipwrecks and I'm uh, also pursuing uh, more nautical history. I've got three book projects on the go. Who knows whether they'll ever get finished, <laughs> but uh, I'm working away on those. And uh, uh, it certainly is interesting. Lots of rabbit holes to travel, travel down and around. Uh, and uh, the big thing is actually finishing one of these projects because uh, it's not much point in having a manuscript that's only half done. Uh, so that's my retirement uh, preoccupation, and it keeps keeps me involved. That's fantastic. Wow. What, what a great conversation. Thank you very much for your time today, John. Thank you, we'll, Ken. We'll leave it there. And um, yeah, I wish you well with the, your you. future projects. Thank you.